Hello everybody, welcome back to another week of Blender. My name is Michael Subterman and today we are going to be talking about rendering and how to make your renders amazing in Blender more than they already are. So what exactly is rendering in Blender? Well, rendering is when you take your camera and whatever you see in your camera scene here in Blender and create an image that you could save or a video file that you can download uh, for your animations and actually download them onto your computer and use them in other things outside of Blender. So this is typically the final step in any Blender workflow where you are completely done with your scene and you just like to create it into an image to be used later on. So let's get into our first major setting when it comes to rendering. So let's go up here to edit preferences and let's click on the systems tab here. And if you have a GPU for your computer, I really, really recommend that you go here and click optics. Optics is the newest cycles render device uh, in order to help you render your scenes out faster and more smoothly. So as you can see here, I have an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3060 and I'm on a laptop GPU. So just make sure that that is checkmarked on optics to make sure that your computer is using the GPU to render out your scene in Blender. So uh, when you go back to cycles here, you can see that the device using is GPU compute instead of CPU. And this will make your renders so much faster and so much smoother. Next up, let's take a look at the samplings tab here under the render properties. So let's go to sampling. And as you can see, there is viewport and there is render. So first of all, I recommend that you check denoise for both, especially in the render, just to make sure that your final render and your scene when you're editing it has no pixelation or noise or grain. So for what we're taking a look at today is going to be the render sub tab here. And the first thing is the max samples. So max samples are how many times you want Blender to sample out your uh, each pixel in your scene. And the higher this number goes, the sharper your scene will be. Typically for a very heavy scene, like the one I have right now with a lot of volumetrics as well as lighting conditions and, and on the cycles render engine, I like to keep the max samples something small with the absolute maximum being something like 1024. Right now I have this at 256 for the sake of this video, so I can render things out faster and show it to you in real time. Next is the minimum samples. I just set this at zero, so if something happens to the render, it'll just fail at zero samples, which is all right. And finally, time limit. Time limit is where you can limit how long it takes for the render to occur. Obviously, when you have higher max samples, each render will take longer. So by setting a time limit, you can instead render it out based on how long it takes as opposed to how many samples Blender should be rendering. Finally, you should have the denoise checked, like I said earlier, and you can leave the denoiser as open image denoise, which is the default. Next up, let's actually talk about our camera settings and how we can use the camera settings to create a more believable scene or a scene closer to what you would like. So if you click the camera here in the scene collection and we go down to this little camera icon here for the object data properties for the camera, uh, as you can see, uh, we have a lot of options here, but I am going to point you uh, first in the lens tab. So in the lens, uh, let's look at the type. So we have perspective, orthographic, and panoramic. So starting at perspective, we have something known as a focal length. And in layman terms, the focal length is basically just how much zoom is in the camera, something like this. Right, the default is 50 millimeters, and usually if you you can achieve a desired effect by zooming in or zooming out with your camera. So for this scene, I think we're going to have a 30, maybe a 40, nah, maybe a 37 millimeter focal length, and we'll keep it in millimeters. Uh, next, for the camera here, we can change the sensor fit and size, but although I tend to leave that uh, at its default. Uh, and next, we also have something known as depth of field. So for those of you who may not be into photography or do not know what depth of field is, depth of field is basically a way for you to blur the background and focus on a key object. Uh, I'm going to try and show you here, although it's going to be a little bit of a weird effect because um, I don't really have a focal object here. But what we can do is you can take the focus object, you can click the eyedropper tool and click an object and it will blur everything behind that object. Alternatively, you could just adjust the distance of the focal length uh, manually, like here. As you can see here, it's getting really blurry and then getting super sharp towards the end. 
but I'm just gonna keep it onto the cube. Uh, next is something known as the f-stop, and I feel like this is the most important thing in depth of field that you need to know. An f-stop is essentially how blurry the blurred part of the depth of field should be. So the higher you go, the clearer it'll be, and the lower you go, the blurrier it would be. As you can see, the reflections are somewhat getting messed over here. So I'm gonna turn the f-stop down actually because I'd like I kind of like that blurred ground effect. Uh, and let's turn it up to something like 0.6. Actually, let's just set it to one just to be safe. So let's save that. And now this is what our uh, scene looks like after we've made the tweaks. Next, you can also change the type of camera in the lens tab in the camera object data properties. Uh, like I said earlier, there's perspective, orthographic, and panoramic, and let me just show you what each of these do. So for orthographic, these uh, this is your camera kind of uh, that is more for isometric views. So you can't really see it here, but if I change the perspective to something like this, you can kind of see how this becomes uh, a little bit more of an isometric view something that you would see in a uh, game that is like 2.5D or has an isometric view, uh, something like that. Uh, and again, you can't really zoom in and out here unless you use the orthographic scale. So the higher the number, the larger the zoom out, and the smaller the number, the more it would get zoomed in. So let's lock the camera to view like that, right? Uh, and then of course you have the shifting X and Y but we'll leave that at zero, zero. The last one is known as panoramic. So let's kind of move the camera a little bit more here to the middle like that. And this is a completely different kind of camera lens. So you have equirectangular, equiangular cube map face, mirror ball, fisheye, etc., etc. So these all kind of dictate what kind of distortion the camera lens would have. Um, so the easiest way to explain this is using fisheye lens polynomial. As you can see, the cube is no longer just a cube, but instead it looks slightly distorted. And now you have K0 all the way to K4. So your K2 uh, is something like this, which kind of adds to the distortion factor. Um, and your K1 is basically your focal length in a perspective camera. And then you have K4 that creates this like ball effect. And you have K3, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. So these could create for some really cool fisheye lens uh, scenes, but that's not what we're going for right now. So we can go for either perspective or orthographic. And between the two, I think I really like the orthographic view from earlier. So we are going to put the, uh, put the camera somewhere like this and zoom out a little. And let's see if we can kind of increase the f-stop a bit because I think the blur is a little bit too heavy for what we're going for here. Uh, and let's keep that as our focus object. Uh, let's reduce that to two. Mm, maybe something a little more. I really do like the blur effect. So yes, let's keep it at that now. So as you can see, we have successfully used a different type of camera lens for this render. So now we are in our desired position for our camera and our scene is exactly how we want it to be. So, but before we render, there is one more setting that we can edit in order to optimize our render times. And that is using something known as tiling. So if we go up here to our render properties uh, and we scroll down to performance, you should see something called memory and use tiling. So I suggest that you should check mark that and you should change the tile size to 256 if you are using your GPU and 32 if you're using your CPU. This way, blend, it will tell Blender to render out the scene 256 tiles by 256 tiles at a time. And this basically allows the computer to run faster and render the image cleaner and faster as well. So now that that's done, we can continue on to rendering the scene. So either you can go up to the render here and click render image, or you can press F12 on your keyboard just like that. And as you can see, the render will start. And just like we told it to, the render will start at 256 by 256 uh, tiles. This way, it'll go much faster. So now let's just wait for this to render.
And just like that, we have our render ready. However, there is still one more step that we can do, and this is known as compositing. Compositing generally is a very long process that requires a whole nother video to talk about, but I'm just going to go into the basics of it and what you can possibly do with the compositing tab. So let's just exit out of the render here. Don't worry, we can re-render it again later if we need to. And let's click the compositing tab here. So originally, this is what it would look like. Uh, and you just need to go up here to the top left and click use nodes. In order to view what you just rendered, you can control shift left click image to bring the viewer node here, especially if you have node wrangler. And this will bring up this backdrop image. And from then on, you can add in nodes as you were, as you would do in a shader editor. So like shift A and you can add things like I like to add glare and you would add it in like this. And as you can see, uh, we can add fog glow. So to add a little bit of glow to our emissions, let's just set that to high and up the size to something like nine. Uh, and let's just connect this oopsies to our uh, composite like that. And yeah, for now, I'm just going to add the glare, but there are so many other options that you can do here. You can add things like vignetting. You could add things like the mist pass, which is a way to add fog onto your scene or artificial fog into your scene. You could do things like color corrections with RGB curves, but I'm going to save that for another video in the future. So now with this glare enabled here in our composite and in our viewer, we can just press F12 again in order to render out the image. And once this image is rendered out, it will take whatever settings that you put into the compositor, uh, in the compositing section, I mean, and it will apply it to the render. So this is one way to composite your images right here in Blender without going to Photoshop first and then maybe editing, adi adding, editing it, sorry, uh, and tweaking it slightly in Photoshop later. And just like that, everybody, we have taken our mediocre scene earlier and turned it into something slightly more spectacular. We've created an orthographic camera view with some depth of field in order to create more depth in the scene, as well as played around with the compositing tab and added in some glare effect to emphasize the lighting uh, points here in this scene. So now hopefully you two know how to create great and amazing renders right here in Blender without having to use things like Photoshop. I hope that you guys learned something from my video today and thank you again so much for joining me this week in Blender. If For those of you who have not done it yet, please consider going down into the description and clicking the subscribe button. It really helps my channel grow and hopefully you can join me on this Blender journey that is hopefully going to be for many years to come. Thank you everybody again for tuning in this week and for those of you who are looking for something else to watch, click the video right here on the screen to learn about 5 Blender hacks that you may not know.